Hello. Okay. This camera just starts. It, I don't have to press start. It just goes. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to do a, uh, a book uh, tour um, of that of that empty shelf. Can you see it over there? Yeah. Okay. So um, instead of trying to balance on a stepladder, <laughs> I thought it would be better uh, for you and for me because I was afraid of falling and also the camera was so shaky you know, it would have induced motion sickness. So, so I'm going to try and do it in the order that, um, that they were up there. I realized I had put them kind of in chronological order. Now let's see how I, oh boy, I messed it up already. Okay. So this was the first that I had, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. I actually had a couple of sort of middle grade versions of this because we read this in, when we homeschooled. And I got rid of those over the summer because I decided I didn't need three different versions, two of them kind of middle grade. Um, I would just keep one. I happen to love this story. Uh, I think it's so, um, you know, so many themes. It's about 4,000 years old, and yet you really can relate to the hyperactive King Gil Gilgamesh and his friendship with Enkidu and um, his his grief and his fear of death and trying to find a way to, to not die and frustration. So I, I think it's a, a wonderful tale and I, I definitely want to keep it. Okay, the next one I had up there is the Portable Greek Historians. And I have not read a whole lot of them. I've read, you know, bits and pieces. I think this was my daughter's when she went to college. She went to a classical college, University of Dallas, where you had to read the Western canon. And um, and then you specialize, I guess, end of your junior year and then senior year, she specialized in politics. So a lot of these, some of these books that I have are, are from her studying there. But anyway, this has Thucydides and Herodotus. So I want to keep this, even though I haven't read it, I'm you know who inspires me to want to read the Greek historians is Mark at Book Time with Elvis because he likes to read these things. Um, but yeah, so I want to keep this. The next one is uh, Aesop's Fables, but not not retold for children, but, you know, I guess the, the real thing. Um, and this is just a good thing to have. So I want to keep that. Um, and then we get into Homer. Um, so this is the Odyssey. This is the one that I actually read to my high schoolers. This is the Rue translation. I do like to look at different translations of these classic works. Um, this was the one I read. See, it's, it's a prose, I guess. Yeah, it's prose. So, so, uh, so I kind of want to keep that because this is the one we actually used. But then, for some reason, I went out to Barnes & Noble, and they I think these were all on sale or something, and I got this beautiful edition. Um, and this is, trans look at the nice, I like the nice map. Uh, this is translated by Samuel Butler. Introduction by Michael Durda. Durda? How do you say his name? I know I've seen him as a, a literary critic. Um, so I did get this nice... This is both the Odyssey and the Iliad. So that seems like something I should keep. Uh, then I have two different translations of the Iliad. Um, and I think I preferred the Lattimore. Yeah, the Lattimore was just more beautiful to read. Um, I personally like the Odyssey better than the Iliad. The Iliad is very... Um, you know, it's war and I don't know. I, I never, I never warmed up to Achilles. Um, who is it that I liked? The one he fought, the Trojan guy, uh, Hector. I loved Hector. Um, didn't like Achilles. Didn't like, uh, I, I just, it was too, uh, the Odyssey spoke to me more than, <laughs> than the other. But I like this version. Um, I also have Fitzgerald, and I think the reason why I wanted Fitzgerald, I don't know what my reasoning was, but 
I have the Fitzgerald um, Aeneid translation of the Aeneid, and I kind of like the idea of having both, you know, the, the Latin that he had to translate and the Greek that he had to translate. But I don't think I cared for him as much. First of all, he spells everything weirdly. Um, you know, if you're translating into English, why do you need to keep the strange spelling that makes it look more, you know, Hector is spelled with a K, Kronos is spelled with a K, uh, everything's spelled kind of weirdly. Yeah, the Trojans and the, you know, Acacian, Acadians or the Acacian, Ac Acony. Oh, I can't remember now. Anyway. So I, I didn't care for uh, Fitzgerald quite as much, but so maybe I should give this away because I already have two copies, right? So do I need three editions of the Iliad? Uh, you know, that seems a little excessive. Um, oh yeah, and last night I noticed that I have another copy of uh, the Odyssey upstairs. I don't know who would, what the translator is for that one up there. So I should bring that down because I'm, what I want to do is group everything together and I don't quite know how to divide things up. Um, so these are just classics. Uh, I sort of started to, to organize these. So these are all just straight classics, you know, from, from ancient times. Um, then this, is, the next one is Plato, the last days of Socrates. And I have read this, the Phaedo, is that how you say it? The Crito, the Apology. Yeah. So, um, oh yeah, uh, Euthyphro. You, oh boy, I'm not pronouncing things. But you know, this one. <laughs> I know I've read it um, a while ago. Am I going to pick it up and, and read it again? Probably not, but I do kind of just like having these classics. Um, so, I don't know. The next one is The Republic of Plato. And this is something you can see. It's still in there. This is from my daughter when she uh, was in college. And she's got all her notes. You can see her notes in here. Um, I, I had an old copy of Republic that I think I got rid of because it was really falling apart. So I would like to keep one, you know, at least one translation of it. So translate it without sound. Boom. Okay. Anyway, so I would like to keep that. Um, and then I've got uh, Rhetoric and Poetics of Aristotle. Now, I was studying rhetoric for a while. Now, did I read this? I mean, did I buy this or is this from my daughter? Read footnotes. Somebody's... I can't tell whose handwriting that is. People made notes in it. Anyway, I did read uh, Poetics a few years back, and I did study rhetoric a little bit um, when I was teaching writing to uh, seventh graders at a at a um, at a co-op. So I'd like to keep that. Then I've got uh, Politics, and this is also from my daughter's college days. She didn't want it <laughs> um, on her own shelf. But I kind of like the idea of um, of having it. Though so this is pretty, this is pretty worked over. Oh, maybe the um, maybe the notes will be interesting though. See what my daughter thought when she was reading it in college. Um, yeah, so we've got politics. Then uh, we've got Sophocles, Antigone, Oedipus Rex, and uh, Electra. Now, I have read Antigone several times, and I think even after I got onto Booktube, I bought this, and I read Oedipus the King and Electra. I think it was either right before or right after I got on, on Booktube. Um, so I, uh, I want to keep these. I enjoyed these. I, I like the Greek tragedies. Um, and then the next one is the Socratic Logic. Now, I have not ever cracked this book. I bought it because we were we were in this classical co-op and they were learning logic. And Peter Kraft is a very popular, prolific writer, a professor of philosophy at Boston College. And uh, I wanted, I, I don't know why I picked this up. I wanted to um, really crack 
<laughs> logic, really learn it. But I, I, I've never done it. I, this book has just sat on this my shelf for years and years, um, untouched. Um, I have another logic book somewhere. Oh yeah, I see it over there. So I should probably put all the logic books together, right? Wouldn't you do that? I mean, it's formal logic. So it's, you know, it's ancient. Um, all right, I don't, don't need that. Okay, so this is a, a book I picked up a few years ago at a used book sale. And it was because I wanted to familiarize myself more with Roman drama. I know a little bit of Greek drama, um, but I didn't really know Roman. And at the, this was years ago, I was leading a Kurtaman team for seventh graders, and that's a Latin quiz bowl. And questions about plays would come up. And so I thought I should educate myself. And when I happened to see this at a secondhand place, I picked it up. So, but I have never read any of the plays. So that's something I should do. Um, then I have uh, Aristotle for Everybody. And this is Mortimer Adler interpreting Aristotle for us. Um, so see, I'm at Aristotle. I, I already went into the Romans. Did I know? So the Romans should be later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess, I mean, even though this is a modern interpretation of Aristotle. I guess it should st still go with things that Aristotle wrote. Is that how you would do it? Is that how you would categorize it? I'm, I'm asking for help because I don't know how to organize things. Um, I would just keep everything about Aristotle in one place. That makes sense to me. Um, whether it's by Aristotle himself or somebody else writing about Aristotle, it would all just be in the same place. So uh, this is a good book, actually. I've read big chunks of it. I don't think I've read it cover to cover, but um, I have read a lot of it. So, yeah, so it's a good one. It's kind of a, you know, Aristotle for beginners. Uh, the next is, okay, this is Greek. Uh, Xenophon, or Xenophon, the Persian Expedition. I had read a really great children's retelling of this. Now, should that go with this? Um, cause that's in an entirely different room for no reason. Um, but this is the person expedition. I actually read this in January of 2022 and I found it really, really interesting. Uh, it's a really, it's a really, um, just heart pounding story about these, these, um, Greek mercenaries who get stuck behind enemy lines and they have to march out. They have to defend themselves and how they do it. Xenophon becomes a leader to get them out. Uh, and it's quite a thrilling story. So I really enjoyed reading this one. And then this is a middle grade thing, which I had never read. I think my husband read it out loud to our kids when we were homeschooling. Um, and I know it's, I know the Golden Fleece has to do with Jason and the Argonauts, but I have never really read those, those Greek myths. And this is just a retelling. This is a famous, um, he wrote, when did he write? Um, maybe back in the 1920s? But anyway, he was a popular uh, author who retold a lot of uh, Greek myths for children. So I would like to read this one day. Uh, so I don't want to get rid of that. All right, so let me go into my, is this my Roman section? Yeah, let me go into my Roman section. Okay, so that, that was Epic of Gilgamesh and then all the Greeks. And then I have this edition of um, the Aeneid. Now I have some, I might have some children's retelling of the Aeneid. So they should probably all go together. I tend to, to divide things up. Um, you know, middle grader or children's stuff was in one section and then you know, the originals or for more adults um, was in another section. But I'm thinking, is it more sensible to just put everything all together in the same place? Um, it seems like it would be easier to remember or be easier to find things that way. But anyway, this is by Fitzgerald. And um, I might have liked this better than his Iliad. Um, but... Um, yeah, so I want to keep this. All right, so I've got Roman drama, the Aeneid. 
Now this I'm really excited about. This is Ovid's uh, Metamorphosis. And I bought this and I was going to read it last year. Because last year I got, I was trying to bone up on my Latin and, and advance a little bit more. And, um, and I was teaching myself from a textbook called um, Latin with Ovid. And so I decided I was going to go out and actually buy a translation and I went to Barnes and Noble and there was a couple different translations and this is the one that I really seem to like the most. I, the language seems really beautiful. So I got this one and but I never read it. So I'm thinking this year I'm going to do um, Ovid in April. I mentioned this to Jennifer Brooks because she did a whole video on a link to it on classics that she wanted to read this year and this is one of them and um i would i want to do that too so i'm thinking of dedicating april to reading this i might do that yeah and then i have uh cicero's selected work so i know cicero is this great figure um and i have not i've you know i've read quotes and stuff by him but i have never really sat down and read his speeches or whatever his selected works um, so I just, you know, I bought this and it's just sat untouched on the shelf. <laughs> um, let's see. I also have Plutarch's Lives Volume 1. Now, this is an, another problem. I have Dryden's translation of Plutarch's Lives, a really thick volume upstairs in another, in my bedroom. So why is that up there and this is down here? Shouldn't they be together? And why do I need both? Of course, Dryden's a little bit hard to read. Now, this is the Dryden translation. So this is the same thing. So why did I, how did this happen that I wound up with two of the same things? Except this is only volume one. So maybe I should just keep the one upstairs and get rid of this one. Although this is nice and floppy. Maybe a little bit easier on the eyes. Um, I'll have to see how the other one is. Anyway, I have read some of Plutarch's Lives. I would like to read more. Uh, I don't know. This is, I might not need this. Um, then I have, now see, should this be grouped by all the books that I have by C.S. Lewis? Or should I have it up because it's a retelling of Cupid and Psyche? Um, so I don't know. Where should I put this? Should I, I mean, I do have several of C.S. Lewis's books, so... Should they all go together or should this be in the classic section? Uh, I don't know, but I love this. I've read it twice now and it, I this is one of the, my favorite things that C.S. Lewis wrote, Tilia Faces. Okay, and I think, I think that might be all the ancients. Let me see. Uh, I have Eusebius, The History of the Church, and I've read chunks of this um now this was written in latin this comes later this is like early middle ages when did he yeah this is early middle ages um so this is kind of a you know a bridge between the romans and uh the middle medieval times and then i have a bunch of beowulf retellings because my middle son was very interested in Beowulf when he was like 14. He thought it was the coolest story. So I got this because this was actually the same edition that I read in uh, high school. And I found it at Bethlehem Books, which is a very nice uh, online, I'll link to it. It's a, it's a great place to buy old books that you can't find anywhere else. So this is, you know, it has nice illustrations. So, and it's pretty good. It's, it's, um, retold by Ian, Ser I don't know how you say his last name, Serralier, Serralier, but he wrote another, The Trumpet of Krakow or something. He wrote another really popular middle grade book. Um, I do like these black and white, uh, illustrations. So anyway, so it's a pretty good translation. And then we got a Beowulf. Uh, translated by Charles Kennedy. I don't know why we have this version. Do I need this version by Charles Kennedy? I, 
I don't know. And then um, this is nice because it's a Seamus Haney's translation, which got so many rave reviews. Uh, it's a really beautiful, beautiful translation. See, we read through it. You can see we studied it in high school, right, in homeschooling. So, yeah, so, so I want to keep the Haney, and I want to keep this version because that's the one that, where I first was exposed to Beowulf in high school. I'm not sure if I need this one, though it's kind of neat to have different translations. Then this one is, is, a, is a retelling in prose, and I think he takes a lot of liberties. It's kind of dumbed down. I don't know if I like this one. It's by Robert Nye. So I'm not sure about keeping that one. And then we have the Grendel by John Gardner. Now this is a modern retelling. So does that belong with it? Like should everything that I have that relates to Beowulf all be together with Beowulf? Is that how I should group it? I don't know. Um, so yeah, and then, okay, I'm getting to the end here. This is long, 21, sorry. So I was like 30 some books on that shelf. Um, then I have two versions of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And the one that I would really want to keep is the J.R.R. Tolkien one, because that one I actually taught to the seventh graders at the co-op. And that was really fun to teach. I really enjoyed that. And this one is the Penguin version. Who translated this? Ah. Brian Stone. I don't, I mean, it is a penguin. It's nice to have penguins, but... I'm not nearly as attached to this one as I am to this one, which I really enjoyed. Um, then let's see, what else do we have? Um, hmm. Okay. Let me get all these. Okay. So I took a medieval English literature class in college. It was one of my favorite classes ever. And these three things are <laughs> are from college, so this is a long time ago. <laughs> but this is Every Man. These are medieval miracle plays. Um, yeah, I remember really enjoying. I don't know if you can see my notes. I remember really enjoying reading these. Um, so I don't want to get rid of that. And then the alliterative uh, Mort Arthur. Now I have another retelling of King Arthur upstairs. So maybe that should be down here. Um, it's the retelling by, um, oh, I can't remember his name now. Famous writer, you know, in the early 1900s. Anyway, so I have this, and this is where I read King Arthur. Um, so I don't want to get rid of that. I'm so attached because of the class. And this is a wonderful collection of medieval English poetry. And we had so much fun reading this. Uh, this was so good. Um, so I, I treasure this particular book. And then I have... My husband bought this one. It's the Mabinogi. How do you say that? He went through a period where he was really interested in the Welsh mythology. Um, and so he bought this. I have not read it. Um, the Cloud of Unknowing. So this is a religious text, I think. Yeah, but it was written in Middle English. So does that go in religion or does that go with medieval stuff? I'm not sure, but, and I have not, I think I bought it secondhand somewhere, and I don't think, oh, I started to read it. Look, got a bookmark in here. Um, yeah, this is a great bookstore in Washington, D.C., Politics and Bros. Uh, so I got to chapter three, um, but I haven't, I don't remember reading it. I don't remember it. Oh, and I have another bookmark here, so maybe these aren't my bookmarks. Why are they shoved in like this? Well, anyway. I don't know. Should I keep it or not? I don't know. And then this is uh, Two Lives of Charlemagne. And I bought this because at the co-op where they taught, they were, they wanted to have um, an adult book group. Like all the parents uh, could be in a book group. And we were going to read this, and then we never did. 
So I bought it, but I have not touched it. And then this is the Canterbury Tales. And this is what I bought when I was, we read a few tales. I didn't dwell on them very much when we were doing high school. I don't know why I didn't. They were kind of body, and I didn't really <laughs> read body stuff with my teens. Um, and so we just did a few of them. Um, so yeah, so that this was the text we used. Um, and then the last three, and then I think I'm done. I have a uh, T.H. White's uh, Once in Future King, which is, of course, a retelling of March Arthur. Um, and then I have Those Terrible Middle Ages, Debunking the Myths by Regine Pernot. This is a um, popular um, Catholic historian, French Catholic historian, um, who tries to counter the myth of the Dark Ages. And they weren't so dark. Um, and uh yeah so yeah that's something i i think i started to read it it looks again it looks like i have a bookmark here i got to page 29 um so maybe i want to read that maybe that would be a good thing to read for historathon i have to see what it focuses on because i have a particular interest in just the cultural stuff how how uh, just how they did things how they cooked food how they Farmed, that sort of thing. That's what I'm interested in. And then I have Catherine of Siena by Sigrid Unstead. I have tried to read this a couple of times. I cannot get into it. I, Catherine of Siena, I know that she was revered. I know popes sought her guidance and people traveled from all over to, to you know, get her. She mentored many people. She was highly, highly respected. She must have been extraordinarily intelligent and profoundly devout, but she was so ascetic. She fasted. She basically killed herself by fasting herself to death. And she was so into that self-flagellation and stuff like that, that I just, I find it creepy. And like, maybe she had a mental illness. I don't know. I, I And people rave about this book, about how Sigrid Unset portrays her and I just, I just, I don't know. I can't warm up to Catherine of Siena. I'm sorry. I feel like I have to hand in my Catholic card. Anyway, that is, was the shelf tour. Those are all my books. My questions are, how would you organize them? I think I need to gather in the books that are scattered through the house and put, put all the books that deal with one topic or one author together. That's how I want to do it. I, Because I get so frustrated, I can never find my books. I, I, I'm always thinking of a book and then I go look for it and I can't find it. It's just not in a logical place for me. And yet the idea of like cataloging and all that stuff, that's just, I can't, I can't go to those lengths. I just can't. I know I'll never finish it if I start a project like that. So I need to be simple, simple and organized. So what would you do? That's what I'm asking. I'm seeking advice. All right. I hope this wasn't too long. Uh, take care and I will talk to you later. Bye.